Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to, to my talk. Um, yeah, so my name is Edward Grandstrom, and I work as head of marketing at uh, Do Dreams. And Do Dreams is, of course, the developer of the Drive Ahead series of mobile games. And to those unfamiliar with our flagship title, Drive Ahead, it's a physics based head to head car battler. Uh, we've launched it almost four years ago, but uh, it still has quite a steady amount of users and a, a, a substantial community around it. Um, we actually we take great pride in creating games that are not only fun to play, but also fun to watch and share with others. And through this strategy, we've actually been able to um, reach over 100 million downloads for our games. And still today, even though the game is a few years old, we still get over 100,000 new organic downloads every day. Um, but of course, a massive influx of users like that also causes substantial amounts of churn. And as we know, that can cause anxiety. So today I'm going to be talking about how we at DoDreams use service design to develop and optimize our in-game marketing efforts and how we shape the user journey. Um, and though some of the learnings we've gathered here are actually more apl applicable to some of our games uh, in development, I'm going to illustrate some of the points with implementations we've been able to make for uh, Drive Ahead. But first, to introduce myself really quickly, um, before joining Do Dreams, I worked at Rovio Entertainment for almost seven years. Um, I worked on quite a few titles during that time, but mostly Angry Birds 2 and Angry Birds Match. And I also have a background in business development and e-commerce. And I guess especially the e-commerce part has kind of uh, shaped how I like to focus on service design and uh, UX and conversion and efficiency when uh, developing. So as I mentioned before, churn has always been our number one issue for the game. And what we originally figured was that we need to give players more stuff to do inside the game. So given more game modes, more content, and the freedom to choose between that game mode or those game modes, um, we figured that would solve our issues. But that didn't quite work out that way, because the more we introduced new game modes, sometimes our KPIs would even go down, but certainly not make them better. Um, so once our tools and methods were developed enough to actually look into this issue a bit more, we took a really deep dive into this problem and started by analyzing our player paths and watched how our players kind of interact with our content within game sessions and between game sessions. And we found that our main problem was that Drive Ahead had become a bazaar. So there was tons of new discoverable content inside the game, but navigating your way through it was challenging. And what happened was that new players would feel overwhelmed by the multiple game modes and the lack of hierarchy between the game modes. And even worse, players that did stick around kind of had developed or formed <coughs> habits of engaging only with one specific game modes and continue to do that all the time until they finally churned. And in fact, regardless of what game mode a person was engaging with, there was about an 80% chance that the following game mode would be the same one. And then the next biggest uh, probability was that they would end the playing altogether. So for instance, our classic mode, as you can see here, 74% of players who start playing classic mode continue playing that same mode without really going into uh, our, other, our other parts of the game, and that became an issue for us. Um, so this was a serious problem, considering we've, we'd really spent a lot of time working on uh, especially live ops events that we knew were superior experiences to, to some of our so-called legacy game modes, and we were unable to get people to even try them out. So here's where we are. And we started thinking about how to fix this. And as we were throwing around the bazaar analogy in the office, we kind of thought, why not fix this on the same analogy level? So what's the opposite of a bazaar? Well, that one was quite easy, actually, because that's, of course, IKEA. It's actually IKEA's 75th birthday today, so what a day to be giving this talk. 
But yeah, love it or hate it, uh, one can't deny that IKEA has been able to design a customer journey which goes far beyond what most retailers are capable of. But what exactly is IKEA doing differently and how does that translate to mobile games? Well, there are of course tons of different strategies that an established retailer and company like IKEA uses to shape their user journey, but we've chosen specifically to look at three different parts of it and I'm going to be walking you guys through those right now. So first off is personalizing the value proposition. So the value proposition in the experiences or the interactions with IKEA are not necessarily the same one for everybody who engages with them. In fact, they've made a practice of analyzing customer values and attitudes and interests and use those insights to hyper-optimize their communication. So while some customers will be uh, you know, favoring the reasonable pricing, other will be looking for the Scandinavian sleek design, somebody else might be going there primarily for the meatballs, and then there's of course the space-saving solutions for people who are mindful about that. And the point being here that a brand can represent different things to different people and there's no one way to that rules all of them when uh, looking into in-game marketing communication. So in mobile games, varying the marketing message is of course mostly used in UA where you can have tons of different versions of your creatives flying around uh, the internet. But there are use cases for this philosophy inside the game itself. And for us, uh, as we've had an issue with players spread out into the different game modes, what we, were, what we are working on building now is an in-game marketing system that allows us to customize our marketing communications to highlight qualities and features in different events and game modes that match individual player behavior. So, and the end goal, of course, is trying to break the vicious cycle of people kind of getting stuck in, in one game mode and remaining there until they churn. So for this example, um, we have a Hot Wheels collaboration event that, that uh, recurs every week. And even though at the moment we're only able to uh, change the copy on these kind of pop-ups that we run between and after the event, it's still a good start for us. And, and uh, yeah, this is something we're really developing further. So number two is focusing on the peak end rule. And the peak end rule is a uh, psychological phenomenon where people tend to uh, judge a past experience based on the most emotionally intense moments of that experience, as well as the end of the experience, instead of kind of the whole sum or average of all parts of it. And with the IKEA example here, so say you're slowly walking, you know, you're making your way through the IKEA showroom. You may maybe have a couple of kids with you, they're growing increasingly restless and you're already feeling like a tension build up in your stomach and you haven't even reached the actual store part yet. So these kinds of emotions obviously won't make you more inclined to do some heavy shopping while you actually reach the store. But what is it you see? There's more meatballs and there's toilets and there's play areas. And the reason they do place this restaurant like exactly in the middle of their shop is so that you would kind of have a super positive experience after you've been privy to their, you know, marketing messaging throughout the showroom. Um, also, it's no coincidence that after you've, you know, checked out and arranged your delivery options and everything, and also tried to figure out how getting batteries and a light bulb escalated into a living room makeover, what you see next is a stand selling reasonably priced hot dogs and ice cream. Because who cares how much you spent? because you're basically robbing them with these items. Now, as Drive Ahead essentially is a collecting game with uh, dozens of vehicles and helmets determining how much fun you have in the game, what we, or for us, it's very natural to kind of give out new items towards the end of an experience. But it's also important to distinguish here that we don't want to just hand out items for free. Because if a service or product makes a task too easy, it also runs the risk of kind of undervaluing the players. And for a skill-based game like Drive Ahead, that's basically taking out the main reason of, or main feeling of achievement that comes with playing the game. So what we're doing instead is uh, 
we're beginning the session with these events or daily challenges that are kind of designed to have top rewards, but also have the re rewards like super reachable. Um, so we were able to give our players like an emotional high quite early on in the experience and then send them along their journey with a, you know, encouragement to go try out that new special car. So these events are actually quite short and uh, designed for a player to be able to complete them in, in a, quite a short amount of time. Number three is mapping out the customer journey. So when it comes to the layout of an IKEA store and the path customers take when uh, getting from entrance to exit, very little is, of course, left to chance. And for IKEA, they, of course, use uh, a bunch of quantit quantitative and demographic data to, to really allow for optimizing inventory and clustering together products that tend to be purchased together. But they also use qualitative data to uh, figure out how to build their showrooms, to really investigate how people live and how they behave and, and what's the optimal way of setting that up. And it's a powerful tactic because it allows their customers to really experience their solutions instead of just trying to imagine them. And for us, of course, what we wanted to do was start by building a similar, very simplified setup to, to uh, how, we're, how we're working at the moment. And as we knew, the majority of players would go directly from tutorial to settling in on one game mode, basic, basically for all eternity. We instead employed the concept of IKEA showroom to gently encourage them to take part in our events. And in practical terms, that means was that when a person entered the game during the time we were running these events, they were forced to walk through the showroom of the event, which in this case is, of course, the event lobby. And it's a very simple, it's a very simple setup. We made the events opt out instead of opt in. And the results? Well, event lobby doubles visited. Uh, sorry, event lobby visits doubled. And of course, that is to be expected since now nobody had a choice. Everybody had to go through the lobby. And one kind of criticism or uh, risk we had thought about internally was that if we used the showroom tactics, potentially the only thing we'd accomplish is a bunch of pissed off players who will hit the back button and go back to what they were going to do anyway. Um, but that's not actually what happened. So in fact, out of these new players that came into the game, our event participation increased 88%. So this is actually not people only visiting the lobby, obviously, but, obviously, but people actually playing the event. Also, our IAPs increased 56% within the event. And our amount of players watching ads increased 129%. So our conclusion for this was that perhaps it's not poor UX after all to kind of make your players see that cool content you worked hard on creating for them. So to summarize, our approach to in-game marketing has resulted in these three practices and recommendations. So first of all, personalize the value proposition. Players will have different motives, even though they interact with the same content. So identify those motives and customize the message. Number two, focus on the peak end rule. Make sure that each, se each session includes elements of the absolutely most fun and rewarding part of your gameplay, because that's what they will remember after it's done. Also, if possible, try to predict when a session is coming to an end and give them something that could be classified as hot dogs and ice creams in this case. Number three, map out the desired player journey. So identify points where your players stray off the path and make sure your players are actually exposed to the content you created for them. So that was, those are our recommendations.